Once upon a time, not that long ago actually, two European countries, Spain and Portugal, all of a sudden became some of the greatest superpowers in history. And it was all thanks, or at least in part, thanks to the vast riches they brought back from the Americas. But did you know that both countries started their American venture by mistake? Hi, my name is Sebastian and you're watching Mistakes That Changed The World. In 1491, a certain Spanish ship captain made a mathematical mistake when calculating the circumference of the Earth. A line drawn around the planet at the equator has a length of approximately 40,000 kilometers. This information had been known and verified through various mathematical calculations since the times of ancient Egypt. However, Christopher Columbus, because that's who we're talking about, was convinced, based on his own calculations, that the circumference of the Earth was less than 25,000 kilometers. This difference of 15,000 kilometers was the reason why he believed that by sailing west from Spain, he could reach China. If it had been correct, it would have been an easy journey. The error seems to have originated from incorrect latitude and longitude numbers used by Columbus while studying Chinese maps. He may have even used distances as indicated on the maps of Ptolemy, which were also completely wrong. During that time period, the rivalry between Portugal, which used an arduously long route to the east by circumnavigating Africa, and Spain, was intense. We're gonna talk about Portugal in a minute, don't worry. The Spanish monarchs were willing to do almost anything to gain entry into the incredibly profitable trade with Asia. You may have heard the story of Columbus, who convinced Queen Isabella that the Earth is round by using an orange. That is actually a myth. Something like that couldn't have happened because in the 15th century, any half-decently educated European already knew that the Earth is round. Columbus's mathematical error explains why the advisors of Ferdinand and Isabella unanimously opposed funding his ludicrous expedition. Not because they believed the Earth was flat, but because they had verified the navigator's calculations. The scholars at the Spanish court opposed funding the explorer because the math was wrong, plain and simple. Be that as it may, the Spanish monarchs decided to take a chance with Columbus, and in 1492 they provided him with three relatively small vessels in spite of his lack of mathematical skills. I don't know, maybe it was just a cheap way to get rid of him after he had been pestering them for months, who knows. Regardless, the rest, as they say, is history. Columbus set sail with the Nina, Pinta and Santa Maria. At the end of his heroic journey, he discovered the New World. Well, actually, he discovered a few islands in the Caribbean. Those details are not that important for this story. What's important is that there was something there, and Columbus showed it to the entire world. Convinced that his own calculations had been confirmed, the captain named the indigenous people Indians and referred to the islands as the Indies. But, despite his discoveries and adventures, in the end, Columbus died, well, not poor, but he wasn't a wealthy man either. He would, however, be astonished to learn how today he is both revered and hated. Turns out he wasn't a very nice guy. He would also be somewhat disappointed to discover just how inaccurate his calculations were. For Spain, though, and Europe as a whole, this mathematical error may have been the luckiest mistake of all time. It brought two centuries of substantial spoils to the Spanish crown and opened up the Western Hemisphere to Europe. Not to mention their domination in Asia, Oceania and Africa. Okay, so that's how Spain found its fortune, but what about Portugal? Well, first some context. The Portuguese spice route to the east was the secret that brought glory to this otherwise small nation. They'd found a route, albeit a long one, that bypassed the Arab, Turkish and Italian merchants. They chose to navigate around Africa, 
sailing south and then up along the eastern coast before crossing the ocean to India. Navigation methods were primitive and food preservation techniques were no more advanced. Any extended period of time spent at sea could make a ship disappear from history and condemn its crew to death by dehydration or starvation. So most traders in the 15th century tried to stay close to the coasts. Long voyages were risky, yes, but extremely profitable. If only one out of ten ships returned loaded with spices, the profits covered the costs of the lost vessels and ensured investors a 1,000% profit. As profitable as this business was, it was about to get even more lucrative. In 1500, a Portuguese merchant named Pedro Álvarez Cabral led his own fleet of 15 ships in an attempt to follow Vasco da Gama's newly opened route to India. However, things don't always go as planned. While going around the Horn of Africa, by pure chance, his ships were pushed out to sea by unusual winds. This would have caused some concern on board the ships. As I said, sailing in those times was a dangerous business even when things went according to plan. But they kept their cool and headed south, and on April 21st, the sailors spotted seaweed, prompting them to believe they were approaching some shores. And they were right. The next day, they came across an unfamiliar shoreline. Cabral knew it couldn't belong to Africa since it was on the opposite side of the ocean. This place was to the west, and considering he should have been sailing down along the African coast, any land should have been to the east. This was a strange and wild land, mostly covered in jungle. He saw a mountain he named Monte Pascual. Today, we know this place as the country of Brazil. As monumental as this discovery was, Cabral had other matters to attend to. He had set out in search of spices, not new continents. So, after sailing along the coast for 10 days and claiming the new territory in the name of his king, Manuel I, a procedure more or less common in those times, the Portuguese admiral wrote a report and sailed east until he found a coastline on the correct side of the ocean. Cabral eventually reached India and four of his ships returned to Portugal after a little over a year. The four ships, filled with spices, enriched Cabral and his fortunate investors. He presented the report about the newly claimed territory to the king, but no one really cared. Cabral hadn't seen any golden cities or diamond mines, so there was no gold rush towards these new strange lands. It actually took another 25 years for someone else to navigate to Brazil. But in the centuries that followed, the wealth of Brazil turned the small nation of Portugal into a rich, powerful and prosperous empire. When Pope Alexander VI later attempted to make peace between Portugal and Spain in their struggle for the new world, Cabral's accidental discovery while wandering the ocean gave his nation the right to claim Brazil. Now, I do have to mention that there are some scholars who believe the likelihood of making such a landfall as a result of freak weather or a navigational error was remote. And so, it's actually highly probable that Cabral had been instructed to investigate a coast whose existence was not merely suspected but already known. This theory, however, is unproven, so we'll go with the already accepted version of history. For Portugal, that unusual wind that diverted Cabral into unknown waters turned out to be the best thing that ever happened to them, even though, initially, nobody seemed to care the slightest bit. I hope this video was interesting enough to have inspired you to look into it further, on your own. If you liked it, leave a like and subscribe. Leave your comments downstairs, and you can also check out my Patreon page if you want to support me. I do hope to see you next time. Bye.